Hello everyone. Um, I'll be joining you in just a moment, but to begin with, I'd appreciate it if you just take a look at this short poem that I put up on the screen. Um, I want to uh, I want to bring in a few more people before we begin the program. So uh, this is the starting of the program and I will be with you in a moment. Okay, yesterday, um, yesterday I was looking through uh, Facebook and one of my friends who happens to be a, a Jungian psychotherapist uh, highlighted this particular poem and it really touched me and it caused me to want to start to read to my wife. We used to read together uh, frequently. Uh, I read all of Man and, and His Symbols to my wife about three or four pages a night right before we went to sleep. And it took us about a year to read it, or it took me about a year to read it. And uh, she only slept through half of it. But in any case, um, I hope you can see this fine. Uh, this is the poem that my friend uh, brought to my attention. And so I wanted to bring it to your attention because I think it's a very nice poem and it's a nice idea for your uh, loved one. And so it's called a, a Ritual to Read to Each Other. If you don't know the kind of person I am and I don't know the kind of person you are, a pattern that others made may prevail in the world. And following the wrong God home, we may miss our star. For there is many a small betrayal in the mind, a shrug that lets the fragile sequence break, sending with shouts the horrible errors of childhood, storming out to play with the broken dike. And as elephants parade holding each other's tail, but if one wanders, the circus won't find the park, I call, to cru I call it cruel and maybe the root of all cruelty to know what occurs but not recognize the fact. And so I appeal to a voice, to something shadowy, a remote, a remote important region in all who talk. Though we could fool each other, we should consider, lest the parade of our mutual life get lost in the dark. For it is important that awake people be awake, or a breaking line may discourage them back to sleep. The signals we give, yes or no, or maybe, should be clear. The darkness around us is deep. By William Stafford, the way, from the way it is. Okay, um... So I really like this idea of uh, the ritual reading and um, that's why I brought it to your attention this evening. I read this to my wife yesterday and uh, she rather liked it and I asked her to read something back uh, to me and uh, so she, she brought something to read, which I also think is very nice. 
and uh, begging your indulgence a little bit longer uh, as you come aboard this evening. Uh, I'd like to uh, also read uh, this piece that my wife read to me yesterday in response. And so, let's see, where is it? Just a moment. It's garbage in, garbage out, but... Um, Here it comes. Okay, so this piece is called It's All Love, an ancient antidote to modern anxiety. Small everyday events can be a source of wisdom. This story is about a cup of coffee. Before I tell you this story, it is helpful to have some context. My wife, Mamie, brought the phrase, it's all love, into our marriage. We use it jokingly, like when one of our dogs chewed a favorite pair of my shoes, and we say it seriously, like when we are worried about one of our children. We use this phrase to support each other and to remind ourselves how precious life is, even when we are annoyed, disappointed, and anxious or anxious. I began a practice of stopping and saying it to myself several times during the day. I have a, I have a reminder app on my phone and a watch that vibrates on my wrist. As I say it, I take two or three deep breaths and smile gently until I can feel it in my body, a sense of appreciation and gratitude and kindness. The practice is more than saying it. It is important to feel it as well. The practice is to connect to the love that I have access to at all times. The teaching of all lasting wisdom traditions is that we do not need more stuff the approval of others, good weather, or the right wardrobe to access the incredible human resource of unconditional love. Okay, so here's the story. About a month ago, I was driving to see a new client. I was wearing my typical work clothes, a button-down Oxford and khakis. I had my morning cup of coffee next to me. Someone stepped off the curb to cross the street in front of me, and I stepped on the brakes to stop quickly. My coffee went everywhere. It was like a little tiny caffeinated volcano erupted onto the dashboard. My pants, my shirt, and all over the floor of the car. My whole body instantly tightened, and I could feel my nervous system searching for someone to blame. And then, clear as a bell, I could hear a kind voice in my head. It's all love. It wasn't something I consciously said to myself. It was a pleasant surprise that just showed up. All that practice led to the helpful reminder when I needed it. I pulled over, cleaned up the spill, and went on my way to my appointment. I did not put any more energy than was necessary into dealing with the situation. I still had a big coffee stain on my pants, but this moment was the highlight of my day because I had experienced it with unusual grace. I have been sharing this with my clients, and here is something one of, my, one of them sent me recently. It's all love. That expression has changed our home. It keeps me counting back to some accept, it keeps me coming back to some acceptance. A few times already, I've been all caught up at work, and then I see the little pink slip I have on my computer with the words, it's all love, and I come back to myself to this moment instead of rushing ahead. My husband almost often reminds me, it's all love. It's really hitting home, a home run, actually. It might be helpful 
it might be helpful for you to know that my client is facing significant challenges. Her husband is struggling with a chronic illness and they are having a hard time getting health insurance. She works full time and they have a young child who has been sick for a long time as well. Something I have learned from many of my courageous clients is that even when my life, even when life isn't easy, we can practice loving more fully. Many of us spend time hoping that circumstances will work out the way we want them to, but we live in a profoundly complex and unpredictable universe, so we cannot know exactly what the future will bring. Rather than clinging to hope that brings rather than clinging to the hope that things will be the way we want them them to be, we can develop the faith that no matter what shows up, we have the internal resources we need to deal with it. This practice does not erase hardship or discomfort. This practice makes us more resourceful in the presence of hardship and discomfort. So what wisdom can come from a spilled cup of coffee? As human beings, we have the choice of looking to the world around us for the love that we seek or cultivating it internally, independent of our circumstances. And who knows, it may, it may just show up when we need it most. Okay, so anyway, Dave, who is the author of this, uh, helps individuals with and teams build the skills to find calm, clarity, and connection in a stressed, anxious world. And so, and I got this from um, the Huffington Post, and it's called, It's All Love, An Ancient Antidote to Modern Anxiety. So, that ha that's my... Um, delaying tactic for the beginning of this session so that uh, we could have a few more people join us. And um, so let's see who's here. We have uh, a couple people. Gray's here and Lara Smith is here. Hi, Lara. And Freaky Bro is here. Hello. And uh, there are a few others, but they are uh, in stealth mode. Um, so I'm, uh, I think that a lot of things happen unconsciously. And so I'm very taken by this, uh, ritual of reading to one another. Uh, my wife and I have done it sporadically over, uh, our long time together. And, um, we've been married since, 1989 and uh, we've been together longer than that enough said <laughs> but um, but the point is that things can pass between two people um, unconsciously through the voice and through the ritual of caring enough about one another uh, to uh, share that time together and um, I, with with a due caveat though uh, this evening because uh, I was at least a bit rushed to prepare for this group um, I uh, read something from a Buddhist text that I had found this noontime with my meditation class and uh, my wife who's a Buddhist uh, teacher, I guess I can't call her a Lama, but she uh, did do the three-year retreat, which is, uh, which Buddhist monks do, although she did it over seven years in a home study. Um, and she is one of the major teachers of um, Tibetan Buddhism in the Washington area. So I was sort of challenging her on the meaning of some Buddhist term terms vis-a-vis uh, -vis Jungian psychology. And I may share that with you a little later, but um, when we did this reading back and forth, because I read something to her, then she read something to me, and it's what she read to me that I may share with you later. But um, 
it it was a little bit testy so you have to uh, be conscious of who your partner is and uh, what it is you're bringing forth my wife and I are pretty good about uh, dealing with testiness and uh, now that she has shared with me uh, this story it's all love um, then we have a way to uh, settle it pe settle it peacefully I would say so um, this is the first official session when we are strictly online. I have no local uh, participants this evening. Uh, if they're here, they're in stealth mode online. And I am doing this directly to you in the uh, internet audience. And so I recognized right away that um, I've been doing this for, this is the 74th meeting of the reading group. And as a result, uh, I may be considerably in a different place than where you are in, um, in your study of Jungian psychology. So I urge you, if you have questions or comments, I do urge you to uh, make them on the chat. I will certainly try to interact uh, with them. Uh, I'm going to first, be, because this is a, a new group in essence, in other words, uh, some of you have been coming to my Q&As for a while, so you know something about what I do in these things, but uh, some may not, and I have no idea where you are in, um, in terms of your own study. And so I thought that I would begin tonight uh, with, an, with a bit of an overview of Jungian psychology, just as uh, a refresher. And um, I'm, I'm going to intersperse that with um, part of an interview that Dr. Edward Edinger did back in 1997. Uh, but um, what I'm going to do is refer to these notes, and so I need to uh, change my position so that you can see me as well as my notes, and I'm going to share my notes with you directly here, and I'm also going to, um, whoops, that's not it though. There it is. Okay, so I'm going to share my notes with you directly, but I'm also going to read them because uh, many of the people that have followed my Q&As have uh, used the videos for a soporific, <laughs> and so they listen to them as they're going to sleep, <laughs> and, and so they might not be staring at their screen reading these things, and so I... I uh, for their benefit, uh, I'm going to read them out to you. So uh, this is going to be an overview of the psyche and learning overview and learning about the psyche. And be, <clears throat> and as I said, because we have many new participants, um, some of you may not be familiar with this structure. So I want to tell you about it. And the first thing that I want to emphasize, which was uh, a key point in Dr. Jung's oeuvre is that the psyche is real, okay? And Dr. Jung emphasized this, and uh, in paragraph 751 of Answer to Job, you can say, hear him or see him say that explicitly. And he said, uh, you know, if the psyche weren't real, then we'd have to say that the laboratory equipment created the atom bomb. And um, so obviously it's human beings using their psyche that have done that. And of course, I've often said that 
if you look around the room, everything that you can see, with the possible exception of potted plants, was created out of the imagination of a human being. And that includes all the human beings that are within your view. And the reason for that is, uh, at one point, you too were a gleam in your father's eye. And so, so we're all the product of imagination. And not only that, everything, right down to this big pen, um, this big pen was envisioned by someone and then somebody did a mechanical drawing of it and someone else created uh, two or three different uh, plastic molds to uh, produce it and all those things required imagination and those imagination facts uh, are all done in the psyche so that's why I'm emphasizing this idea of the psyche so Knowing your own psyche is a key element of knowing yourself and yourself, which is the greater self. We've, uh, we're going to talk about that tonight. And um, And so one of the things that I wanted to talk about also is how all of this applies to education because all of us who are parents must recognize a couple of facts. Okay, number one, infants, and to a diminishing degree, children, are wild animals. And they must first learn from their parents how they need to act in society in order to survive and thrive. Now, um, they're not born tabula rasa. They're born with many faculties already innate, including the archetypes. Now, you may think that the archetypes only apply to human beings, but that's not right at all. Uh, and so I'll just uh, show you, um, oops, just show you one uh, that I'm rather enamored with which is uh, the mother archetype and what you're seeing in this image is a mother eagle on one of the many webcam cams we have around the United States and uh, she has this is the Decorah eagle that's in uh, Decorah, Iowa and she has three eggs under her and there was an earlier screenshot that my wife and I got, which somehow I've misplaced, but she actually had about an inch of snow on, her, on top of her head. And one thing is clear, the mother archetype is very apparent in this mother eagle, and she would not move even if she were buried under two feet of snow. And so, in point of fact, every creature that has sexuality as part of their makeup, and that means almost every um, multi-cell organism, uh, every creature, um, I should have transitioned this, I guess, um, every creature has the mother archetype in it. Okay. Now... There's another archetype that I think is very interesting, and you may think that this archetype comes from um, human beings, and this is the archetype of the mandala. Now, mandalas have appeared all over the world. Dr. Jung made a, a uh, big study of mandalas around the world, and found them in human populations as far back as 35,000 years ago, I think. Uh, and so there, um, so there are many, many mandalas in, uh, in human history. And uh, just another one that's quite famous 
is uh, this is the rose window at the cathedral of Chartres that I think was built in the 13th century. So human beings have been ma making very complex uh, mandalas and they have been making them with great artistic uh, expertise um, for thousands of years. And uh, I think I think Lara is an artist. She could probably tell us more about this. But in any case, um, like the mother archetype, as I've pointed out here, um, there is there's another mandala, and it, it's in a different species. And this is going to surprise you. Now, this mandala was found in the Sea of Japan, and um, and it's a it's a perfect mandala, absolutely perfect, and. Uh, for years, people were finding these mandalas on the seabed floor, and they had no idea uh, what their source was. And so they started to study them. I mean, divers had found them originally. And uh, let's see, did I get the other one on here? I may have to take a moment to get the other picture on here, because I want to show you what creature... Uh, is making these mandalas. So I guess I need another image. Um, so pardon me for taking a moment to get this for you. I, I'm sure you will not be disappointed. Uh, okay, so... So here is the creature that does it, and it's it's the fugu fish, and it is making a mandala in the seafloor, which is about seven feet in diameter, believe it or not, seven feet. And so in the top image, you can see the fish actually in the process of making it, and Basically, what he's doing is he is trying to attract a female, trying to attract a mate. And so uh, this is, from a puffer fish's point of view, this is the god image. And uh, he wants to make the most perfect mandala he can make to attract a female to come to this mandala and lay her eggs. And believe it or not, this fish is about five inches long. And it's in Japan, it's considered a delicacy, actually. And it is called the fugu fish, F-U-G-U. And it is poisonous. So if you are ever in a sushi bar in Tokyo and somebody asks you if you want to have fugu, uh, make sure you're in a good restaurant <laughs> that knows what they're doing because if you eat a part of this fish, I think it's the liver, um, then you will be um, not making it back to your hotel. Uh, but in any case, my, my point to make about this is that the mandala is absolutely archetypal, not only in the human species, but going way back into our fish ancestry, and um, and so and this is the proof of it. And when I found these images, and if you, it, it's called in English, it's called the puffer fish, P-U-F-F-E-R, puffer fish. And uh, so I urge you to uh, go on to YouTube at some point and look for the video of this because you can see how diligent this uh, fugu fish is in preparing this mandala, uh, which he works on for five to seven days. It takes him five to seven days to make this image. And uh, then the female comes along and lays her eggs and uh, another generation comes. So anyway, but I, I've always thought that that was a pretty amazing uh, archetypal example. Um, 
Well, let's see. Do I want to be in the middle? No, I guess I don't because I want to show my notes again. Okay, so here's my notes again. And um, so we've talked about archetypes and the fact that... Um, I guess I better put it on the screen for you, though. There you are. Um, let's see. So anyway... Um, The point is that from a t teaching, uh, well, the point is that, that all creatures have archetypes in them, whether it's an archetype to build a certain type of uh, nest or whatever it is. Basically, most behaviors in creatures other than human beings are actually archetypal also. And so what I'm going to talk about tonight first is the first four chapters of ION, which is researches into the phenomenology of the self. So this is Dr. Jung doing research, scientific research, into how the phenomenon of the self presents itself. And I'm going to start with uh, chapter one, uh, because this is... Um, all ordered and chapter one and I guess I should also bring up this Edinger uh, thing which Dr. Edinger made a um, a diagram of of this which I had um, but but then I forgot to put it on the on the system so let me quickly grab that image also and well shouldn't take me more than a few seconds to find it here um, let's see Hmm. Oh, here is this it? Figure five. There's the one. Okay. Right. I'll just take off my notes for a minute just to show you this Edinger structure. Uh, this uh, figure appears in uh, Dr. Edinger's The Ion Lectures, which I have been reading in tandem with um, uh, in tandem with the reading of Ion itself. And so what you're seeing in this image is up at the top, this is chapter one. Chapter one is the ego, and so we've got a, a woman's ego and a man's ego here. And, sorry, I can't read what that says, uh, but maybe if we made it larger, I could. Uh, let's just see if I can look at it. I just put, pull it up for myself on my screen too so I can see it as well. Um, okay, all right. So that, um, so the center, um, by the way, let's see. Okay, I have done something to show my cursor. So could anyone out there please confirm that you can see my cursor uh, on the screen? Um, because I'm not sure whether it is visible. Uh, apparently not, because I'm not seeing it in the image on YouTube. Um, 
Okay, all right, let's go on uh, without it then. Uh, so anyway, in the, in the top of this screen, you see a theoretically neutral ego and a woman's ego and a man's ego. And under the ego is a shadow. This is chapter two of Ion. So the, the shaded area that goes down from the central uh, ball, but would go down from each one of them is the shadow. And um, then that passes through what Dr. Jung calls the syzygy, chapter three, which is about anima and animus. Now for clarity, uh, there are uh, thousands of, actually of syzygies. That's actually pairs of opposites. But this in, in terms of Jungian psychology, the anima and animus are the most fundamental syzygy, I would say. And so the uh, syzygy is in chapter three of Ion. And then at depth, the, the very depth of our psyches is the self, which is also referred to as the God image. And this is chapter four of Ion. And so it's the self as personal manifestation it's the self as history, it's the self as world, and it's the self as space-time. And I will uh, get into that again a little bit later, but I just thought it would be useful to take a look at this diagram before I go on. So let me now clear that. And I'll go back to my notes. Okay. All right. So chapter one then is the ego. And the ego is the first part of our consciousness we experience. And it is important for every young person to develop a strong ego first. Um, one that can handle the slings and arrows of life. This process is achieved by going through the Job archetype cycle many times while growing up. And the cycle is contest, defeat, lamentation, and rebirth. And this is how an ego is born. And so a classic example of this is the first day of kindergarten when many of the children come to class and they're crying. Uh, I've actually remember being through that in my own life and I remember <laughs> being through it with my daughters as well. And But what happens is that after mama leaves, things quiet down and after the children sulk for a while and have their lamentation, uh, they see there is something new and interesting to do. And so that is one example of building up the ego so that you can uh, face the slings and arrows of life, as I say. And um, so then uh, another favorite of mine is uh, the reality TV program, The Voice, uh, it's not that I watch it that much, but it is a favorite as an example for this Job archetype. And it does a tremendous uh, service for us. And um, the reason it is, is because when we're young, um, I think most of us have had a fantasy at one time or another that we could be a rock star. I know uh, a lot of people <laughs> have, have uh, electric guitars down in their garage, and if their parents had any sense, they uh, made sure that that uh, the kids had uh, a headset with the electric guitar so that they didn't have to listen to it out into the neighborhood. But whatever, uh, a lot of folks have this a fantasy about becoming a rock star. And that's where the voice comes in because they give literally hundreds of thousands of young people opportunities to, 
to prove that they can sing. And so it, it tests them. And obviously, most of them are defeated. And um, so it's a contest, and then it's a defeat for almost everyone. And in point of fact, if we go back over the 10 or so seasons of the voice program, I think you'll probably agree that you probably can't name any of the winners even. And uh, the coaches who were the rock stars back at the beginning of the 10 seasons are still the rock stars. <laughs> and, and, um, but uh, nonetheless, uh, these young people have had the opportunity to, to be content, to contest and to win a prize, to gain some local no notoriety. And most of them are ultimately defeated. All, all Almost all are defeated. And then they can go back and uh, lament the fact that they are not yet a rock star. And then they can be reborn into what they should have been. And the same is, uh, uh, can be said of sports teams. Um, I had the idea that I could be a football player, but in the 10th grade, I weighed 125 pounds on a team that became league champions, which had an average weight of 164 pounds. Now, remember, this is high school. And the largest player was 195 pounds. Needless to say, I got crushed quite a lot lamented and realized that I would never be big enough to play with the big boys in varsity football. But it happened that the varsity coach lived across the street from us, let me stay on the team on the bench, and let me get smashed many times by much bigger players. He once commented to my father, well, he's got guts. <laughs> Those guts came in real handy when I became a Marine officer and went to Vietnam but it was clear football was not going to be my thing. So in coaching and teaching, it's very important to remember that your role uh, is to allow as many kids as possible to have these developmental experiences, even if only on the practice field. These experiences are what build strong egos. And um, important ideas from... Um, from psychiatrist Edward Edinger, um, the ego as a container can break if more is poured into it than it can stand. And uh, the young person, the young psyche must first have a sense that it is good. And of course, uh, those of us who are parents know that uh, the child doesn't normally use the term I until they're about uh, three years old. And so at that point, they've built up enough of an ego so that they recognize that they are separate. Uh, before that, they are part of the self, actually. They're, they're just part of what uh, Dr. Jung and Dr. Um, Genet used to refer to as the participation mystique. They were just part of the what's going on in the house. They weren't conscious of themselves as separate beings. But when they say I the first time, that's a sign that they're starting to develop a little ego. And But it's very important uh, for that ego to build up because if it doesn't, um, you can really get crushed by life. And um, so my mother uh, was great with me, I felt. And of course, I've always uh, loved my mother, as many men do. And uh, she would always say to me very often that I would grow up to be a wonderful man. And so I always had the image of being a wonderful man uh, that she instilled in me. And every single day when I left for school, she would say the following, go out and set that old world on fire. Now, 
metaphorically, that means a heck of a lot. Um, when, uh, when I was in high school, it just meant to me that I should do a good job in school. But um, we have to remember that children are not going to have to live in the old world, the world that we live in now. They will have to create a new world for themselves and their contemporaries. And obviously we see this, um, this coming up because uh, the internet has changed culture so dramatically particularly since the year 2000, and particularly since um, 2007, 2008, when Facebook and Twitter got going. And suddenly we have people interacting all over the world. Um, for me, it's not very unusual because I've been working uh, around the world for the last 40 years, believe it or not. Um, just to give you an order of magnitude, um, since 1994, I've made 44 trips to India. I've made 23 trips to uh, Saudi Arabia. Uh, I've been to many other countries, Pakistan, Bangladesh. Um, and then I lived in Japan for eight years, three years when I was in high school and um, five years uh, later on, 1980 to 85, I had my um, wife and children in Japan while I operated a company there. I built it from the ground up, and my third daughter was born in Tokyo. And so I've had a lot of experiences around the world. But those differences that we've had in all those different cultures are going to start to evaporate, and they have done. I mean, when I first started uh, dealing with Indians, for example, um, there was, we used to refer to Indian English as Indlish, um, and it was often very difficult to understand what Indians were saying uh, for Americans. This was in the 19... 94, 98 time frame, let's say. Uh, but once the commercial internet got going and Indians got very involved in interacting uh, with both software and with uh, people with American accents as opposed to people with British accents, um, suddenly Indian English has become much, much more like American English. Uh, and much less like uh, British English, actually. Um, and so things are changing, and they're changing extremely quickly. Now, um, do I have any comments on the uh, ego issue so far? Uh, if not, I, I'm going to uh, show you some clips <coughs> from, <coughs> from a video that uh, Dr. Edward Edinger made in 1997 and so I wanted to show you uh, the clip on um, on the ego which is about five minutes and then I will come back to you but let's see what happened to it Did I, oh here we go yeah, okay all right so here is the video and I have to find the control the control is here. Okay, so I'm going to be back with you in about six minutes. They're, they're going, he's going to talk about, in this segment, he's going to talk about the ego and the persona. And the, and the persona, which is the second three minutes, is sort of amusing. And uh, so take a look at uh, what Dr. Edinger has to say, and then I'll come back to you. Uh, when he finishes on the ego, and then we'll go back on with chapter two, which is the shadow. So here's Dr. Edinger. I'd like to say uh, a bit about what it means as one progresses in the process of self-knowledge 
uh, what it means to learn about each of those items of the uh, that go to make up the structure of the psyche that I spoke of uh, earlier. Uh, let's start with the ego. That's the starting point for everything. Uh, one of the uh, one of the, the goals of of the life process, just the natural life process, as as well as the analytic process, is maximum ego development. Uh, one can have no no real analysis. One can have no real uh, confrontation with the unconscious until one has a sturdy, responsible, and uh, ethical ego prepared to uh, to have that encounter. Before that, there's no question of depth analysis. Uh, all, all that uh, is available is a supportive psychotherapy that promotes ego development. You see, it's vitally important, just considering the, uh, the social aspect of the, of the matter, that uh, the members of society have good, strong, reliable egos. That means they have to have a, an authentic sense of, of their own identity. Uh, they have to have acquired a, uh, a responsible character structure that enables them to uh, function responsibly uh, in relation to other people. That's, that's all a product of ego development. So uh, just to start with, uh, Good, uh, good ego development is good not only for the individual, it's good uh, for the society that the individual is a part of. Then the question of, of the persona. Uh, what value is awareness of, of the persona to the individual and society? Here, here again, uh, as with all self-knowledge, uh, both the individual and society benefit. You see, it, it commonly happens that to a greater or lesser extent, an individual is uh, identified with this persona. It's so convenient. It's hard enough to, uh, to acquire uh, competence in a professional career uh, and once that has been achieved, the satisfactions of that achievement uh, uh, are uh, often so significant that there is a strong tendency for the uh, individual then to identify with the professional persona that one learns in the, in the course of his professional training. So the minister learns his persona as he, as he uh, goes through theological seminary and, and then starts, uh, starts his first uh, uh, job as an assistant pastor. The, uh, the medical student learns the medical persona, the, the lawyer learns, uh, learns his, and, and so on. And once that's learned, uh, it, it makes things work so smoothly to operate out of it that there's a strong tendency to identify with it. But the trouble is, uh, for society as a whole, that when, that when one uh, meets one's doctor or one's pastor or one's lawyer or, or whatever, one isn't meeting a full human being. You meet the mask. And I'll speak for my own, my own profession. I won't belittle any other profession that I don't know, but I can tell you that uh, it's a real problem in the medical profession. Uh, doctors are very busy, and it takes too much time to be real. It's much easier to function out of your medical persona. And uh, the great advantage of it, the temporary advantage is, uh, it's, it's like skating on a, 
pond of uh, frozen ice, uh, it doesn't take any effort. You, you don't have to respond out of, out of deeper human realities, and you can get a lot more work done in the day, you, you see. You can see more patients. Uh, if you take time to listen to them and, and respond to them humanly, uh, you get caught up and uh, you uh, get way behind in your schedule. That's all understandable, but uh, if, if self-knowledge is to proceed and if, uh, if uh, individuals are, are going to achieve full, well-rounded uh, human potentiality, uh, it's important for them to discover the reality of the persona and the uh, fact that it's not identical with the ego and that uh, if they choose to identify with it uh, now, and, now and then, uh, they are uh, diminishing them, uh, themselves both psychologically and humanly. And once those things become known, then the, uh, the initial identification is broken. And even though one may have to op operate out of that persona at times, then you know what you're doing. And it makes a world of difference whether you're doing it consciously or unconsciously, because choice is involved. Okay, uh, so uh, you've heard the first little bit from uh, Dr. Edinger, and um, let me bring back my notes here. Uh, so now I'm going to go on to um, chapter two, uh, which is the shadow. And uh, as most of you know, uh, and as I say, um, I will be happy to um, answer any questions that anyone has as we go along here. Um, but um, the, the shadow is uh, the dark side. Um, the, um, uh, you know, don't go over to the dark side or come to the dark side. We have cookies. Um, actually, uh, psychic energy comes from all of the pairs of opposites in our lives. And so uh, you have to have a shadow in order to do anything. Otherwise, you're inert as a stone. And so, uh, but the shadow uh, can be uh, negative. And uh, I think the Catholic Church has a very good approach because it allows people to confess their sins. And that's a way to have at least a vague consciousness of the shadow. And uh, the problem is a lot bigger than that overall as we see in the illumination of our national politics today, uh, red state, blue state, regardless of which position you take, you probably view the uh, opposing position as uh, negative, as the enemy, as whatever it is. And, um, and that's actually the shadow. It's your shadow. It's a projection of your shadow on other people in the United States, because as we go around in our regular day, whatever we do, go to the grocery store and so on, we just see people. We don't see um, Republicans or Democrats. We see people. We treat one another with courtesy and respect for the most part. And, you know, I'm not uh, saying that what we see on television is wonderful. Obviously, it is not. Um, but we have to remember that we have a television uh, system that's bringing us to things that never would have been seen in the history of humanity before this. And uh, unless you happen to be right there. And so, for example, uh, this week we had the attack on YouTube headquarters where a young woman killed somebody and killed herself and wounded at some others. And, um, you know, probably that would have been local news even 20 years ago, but, but it gets all hyped up as a, as a big deal uh, because 
we have a 24-hour news cycle every 30 minutes we have to have breaking news and so the all these cable channels hype all these things up but by and large if we just uh, take a breath and think about the way our life is in the United States uh, mostly we're not threatened by the people that we see now I don't um, I don't mean that that is a perfect situation uh, for every community in the United States. Obviously, it's not. But even um, immigrant communities or um, black communities or Hispanic communities um, today are relatively safe. Um, I remember in 1968, uh, I came to Washington to begin my career as a second lieutenant in the Marine Corps. And at that time, um, the whole of Capitol Hill was a black community, right up to the Supreme Court. And in those days, it was unsafe for a white person uh, to walk behind the Supreme Court on Capitol Hill, out, out um East Capitol Street and out in that part of Northeast Washington. But um, over the years, that changed dramatically after 1968. And by the time my wife and I moved there in 1986, um, we lived at 12th Street, so 12 blocks to the east of the U.S. Capitol Street, uh, U.S. Capitol, uh, on East Capitol Street. We lived at 1200 East Capitol Street in, uh, in a building that during the Civil War was a brothel, as a matter of fact. <laughs> but when we were there, it, it had been renovated. But we lived, um, uh, we lived largely a happy and safe life there. Now, that isn't to say it was perfect. Um, the truth is, in, um, in 10 years, we were victims of 15 crimes. And in one of those crimes, uh, which was an armed robbery, the robber went around, the two robbers went around the corner and murdered the next person that they um, robbed. And... Uh, and so, um, so it, things aren't perfect, and I surely know that they're not perfect in the United States, but they're much better than they were, and, and they are steadily improving. And so uh, we can expect further improvements, I think, in the future. Uh, but, you know, that's, that's our American shadow, and it obviously is showing through in our national politics today. Um, but anyway, I, it seems to me that if you're advising older children, uh, you ought to be talking with them person to person about their shadow and about the fact that these things are normal. I mean, very often they're, uh, they're sexual content or something like that. And, um, children need to be understand that these things are ra rather normal normally um, and not be ashamed of their sexuality. Uh, I think we would do a lot if we could do that. And, um, and I think if egos were stronger, uh, we'd be better off. Uh, and I think that as we get into the Adam and Animus, here in a minute, um, I think you'll see that um, the, those are, I see that I didn't give you the document, so I'll give you the document here. And this document will be available in the uh, Dropbox uh, for tonight under the uh, folder based on today's date 040918. And if you're not a member of our Dropbox, please send me an email to skip.conover at gmail.com with your 
uh, regular email address, not one through Facebook or something like that, but a regular email address, and I can add you to our Dropbox. I've added a couple in the last week. Uh, so now I want to go on with uh, Dr. Edinger's talk here, and uh, so this will be, uh, let's see, it's just, uh, it's four minutes on the shadow and while this is on, I will be looking to your chats also. Um, let's see what I have to do here. Okay, so here is Dr. Edinger. Then turning to the next item, the, uh, the shadow. What's the social advantage of uh, being aware of the shadow? I can tell you it's immense. Because as long as one is unconscious of, of the shadow, uh, there's almost infallibly, it gets projected. It gets projected onto somebody that provides some, some hook, uh, some quality that uh, maybe only in small degree that corresponds to the nature of one's own shadow. Uh, and then when that happens, uh, the, uh, the, the projector uh, has the uh, delightful experience of locating evil. It's out there in you. And uh, now, I, now I know uh, uh, what, to, what to attack in order to make the world a better place. And so uh, in, in, uh, in lesser shadow projections, uh, I guess no great harm uh, is, is done. It, uh, it uh, it's an abrasion in in the general general mechanics of of ordinary human relationships, but once it starts operating on a large collective scale, shadow projection can be disastrous. And I hardly need need to spell out the the examples of it because they're everywhere to be seen, uh, where you've got. Uh, one faction opposing another faction and uh, attributing dark, evil, if not diabolical, uh, implications uh, uh, on, the, on the enemy fa faction. We see this everywhere in the world, and I, I'm not going to go into the details, but uh, this is all all the consequence of shadow projection. And uh, it's really a, a disgrace for uh, an educated and uh, supposedly relatively mature uh, human being to, uh, to be caught engaging in a uh, crude shadow projection in this day and age. But disgrace or not, it happens all the time. Uh, and it's a grave damage to, uh, to our social fabric. So to the extent that an in individual, through the analytic process, becomes aware uh, of his shadow, uh, he is then inoculated from shadow projection because he recognizes that the the particular quality or idea or mode of living that is so annoying to him in the other person is an expression of his own shadow uh, 
which accounts for the annoyance. We can have likes or dislikes, but when a certain level of affect uh, enters the picture, that's an infallible indication of a shadow projection. And uh, people unconscious of their shadows are a, a, a grave danger uh, to, uh, to the welfare of society as a whole. Okay, so I'll turn that off and put the structure back up. Um, now, I've had a couple of questions here. So before I move on to the syzygy, to Adam and Animus, uh, let me address a couple of these questions. Uh, so Freaky Bro says, with respect to shadow, could you talk about repression and how that relates to our present-day political issues in the U.S.? Okay, that's fair enough. And Clark Nichols says, people express things now on the Internet, so even when some group thinks they have things sewn shut, word gets out, essentially the traditional elite culture is supplanted uh, by that. Um, I think that's uh, essentially true, um, Clark. But let me uh, let let me go back to uh, uh, Freaky Burrow's question first. I think that that's a fair enough question, and uh, then let's see how that relates into what Clark has said, and see what other comments come up. Uh, so first of all, uh, was the question of could I talk about repression? Um, somewhere in Dr. Young's oeuvre, and I, I've been looking for it, actually I've been looking for the quote for a couple of weeks now because I know I've used it in the past, I think it may be in Mysterium Conjunctionis, but at some point he says that, you know, even the most reasonable man uh, or woman, um, at some point if they're pushed to a certain level, uh, will become a bloody re revolutionary. And this, in fact, has been the cause of many uh, bloody incidents throughout history, obviously. Uh, it was the cause of uh, the American Revolution and the French Revolution, uh, and it's, it's the cause of any... Um, interracial riot or crisis that we may have in the United States. And uh, obviously uh, the United States is a, a huge melting pot. It's, um, I'm proud to be an American and proud of the country as a whole, but I'm not proud of every aspect of it. And obviously um, White Americans have um, repressed uh, black Americans uh, for ever, so for the last 400 years that there have been European and African Americans on this continent. Um, black Americans have been uh, repressed. And it's to uh, Dr. King's great credit that he recognized that the way to get things to change uh, was to do so peacefully because uh, it just makes it too easy to project shadow on someone that's being violent and uh, committing crimes. And, you know, I'm old enough to have been um, a mature, almost second lieutenant in the Marine Corps at the time that Dr. King was um, was killed, and um, I remember um, the riots in in Washington um, at that time, and it, what shocked me was that uh, the black community uh, destroyed their own community. They didn't go to the white community and destroy that. They destroyed their own community. And um, uh, obviously that caused a lot of people to go to jail and so on. And uh, it's 
it's actually the dark side of the nation's capital. I, I often have uh, visitors uh, to this area who I take on tours of Washington because I live uh, 35 miles to the east of Washington and I used to live on Capitol Hill for 10 years. So during that time, I was I was weekly doing tours, but I often do them even today. And uh, one of the things that I uh, go out of my way to show them is the 8th Street corridor, where there are still buildings that are boarded up from that 1968 riot. And it's it's a huge shame for the nation's capital. Uh, it's part of our shadow. I'm sure there are not many um, white American retired Marine Corps lieutenant colonels that go around showing that part of Washington, but I th feel that um, it's, a, it's a shameful sight even today, and it's a shame that the city fathers of Washington, D.C. haven't seen to it that that area is completely cleaned up. Uh, it, it largely is at this point, uh, but you know there's still quite a number of buildings, and I'm talking about uh, three blocks north and east of the U.S. Capitol building, um, where you can see such, such horrors. And um, how, how do you, how do these things get resolved? They get resolved by uh, people living together and seeing that they can live together in peace. And uh, largely we do. Uh, and I give, uh, uh, in terms of our black community, I give the black churches great credit uh, for uh, bringing young men especially along in a way that has allowed them to uh, find a place in society so that uh, today we see um, upstanding men like, um, uh, let's see, it's Senator Booker from New Jersey and uh, Cornell West and Van Jones, people like that, uh, who are uh, Americans. They're not black Americans, they are Americans. And we shouldn't be describing uh, our fellow Americans as anything but Americans. Um, and, uh, you know, there's some parts of our leadership that would uh, divide us up and uh, tribalize us, which causes us to become more primitive, and uh, that's unhelpful. But nonetheless, if we, if we look at the situation that existed in 1968 when I came here as a second lieutenant, and today uh, it's vastly improved. And, you know, I've been all through the South in my career since 1968, and, um, you know, the things that I've seen in my lifetime are just shocking, even going back into the 50s. But, um, you know, lately it's not uncommon to find uh, mixed-race couples in, in Mississippi or Alabama, which uh, 50 years ago, that would not have been possible, and and um, and uh, the story of the of the loving couple who won the right to have a mixed race marriage in the Supreme Court uh, is an example of how things have changed. But people don't like change, so there is repression. There's no doubt about that. And um, it's important to say for every community that that's not good enough, okay? And I say it. It's not good enough. It's not what I want to see in my country. Um, you know, I certainly uh, cringe when I see uh, the way 
Muslims, for example, are depicted on most television stories uh, because I've been to 12 Muslim countries. As I said earlier, I've been to Saudi Arabia 23 times, and I find those countries mainly peaceful. And, um, you know, they're not without their problems, but no society is. And part of the issues in terms of education that I'm trying to talk about in, in this evening uh, relate to how we have to teach our children about these things. Um, and um, uh, anyway, uh, so those are some reflections about it. I hope that is helpful. Uh, people express things now on the internet. Um, yeah, I'm, you know, I've always made it my practice to uh, participate on the internet in my own name. And uh, the fact that people uh, do so anonymously, if they, if they behave on the internet anonymously, very often uh, you find that they're acting out their shadow because they're doing something that they're ashamed of or saying something they're ashamed of or using uh, terminology that they're ashamed of, you know, uh, expletives and that sort of thing. And, um, uh, and so they have to hide their identity. That's not always true, okay? Because, uh, for example, I did participate in a play in Istanbul, Turkey, uh, but I did so via uh, Twitter, believe it or not. Uh, and much to my surprise, I discovered that my Twitter feed uh, was being projected on the wall of the theater <laughs> in Istanbul, <laughs> about 10 feet high and, or you know, 15 feet high and 10 feet wide. Um, and so, um, uh, but I performed with that group uh, 25 times. And um, uh, when I did that, I uh, created a number of uh, Twitter avatars. I won't tell you how many, but I was playing a role sort of like, uh, if you will, the Greek chorus on, on this Turkish <laughs> play. And uh, so I was reacting to things that were going on on the live stream of the play. And, um, uh, and I kept logging in and logging out of Twitter in these different avatars so it would appear to be different people uh, interacting with the play. Uh, and that was a part of the play. And I, obviously, after the fourth performance, I realized that not only was it a part of the play on Twitter, but it was a part of the play in the theater. And it was being literally... Um, broadcast on the wall of the theater. In fact, if I, if I take a moment, I can probably show you a picture of that. I might be able to. Uh, I'm not sure I can put, a, put my finger on um, a picture, but I think I can. Let, let me just see if I've, um, I've put that in a place that I can find quickly. I think it might be on the desktop, so let me just look. Um, ah, yes, here is the picture. Okay. So in this play, um, in this scene, this play is about a fictitious country. And um, just to describe it to you, it's very unique. Uh, the country has two main actors, the president and a um, piano player who's playing piano for tips in the in the main square of the capital of this fictitious country. Uh, 
And so what you're seeing in this image is the president of the country who's on a podium that's about 30 feet up in the air. And behind him, uh, you see the projection of the Twitter feed. And the, the play is about a revolution in this fictitious country. Well, Stranger Than Fiction, uh, four weeks after this play closed, uh, was the Gezi Park demonstrations that uh, caused a number of people to be killed and, um, and you know, great consternation in uh, the Turkish government. And so the result was that... Um, my friends who were the primary actors and primary participants in this play um, ended up having to become exiles. They had to literally leave their country uh, because they were blamed for Gezi Park and their play was blamed as a, as a um, rehearsal for Gezi Park, which I don't believe for a moment that that's true, but nonetheless, uh, that's what they were blamed for by the government. Um, uh, uh, Gray, I'm not sure who who the they is that you are referring to. They have to because they have weak ego. I, I have no doubt that your analysis is correct. I, I'm just not sh sure what you're talking about in that situation. Um, okay, so now I want to talk about the syzygy, the anima, and the animus, and this is uh, very important. Um, recall back when I showed you the uh, diagram of, uh, of the psyche from Dr. Edinger, and the lines went through the anima or, or the animus, and so what typically is happening is that the the men have an anima which is their female side it's a part of the shadow um, it's also part of the soul and that's a entirely different issue uh, and women have an animus and uh, so let me describe it from a man's point of view since i'm a man but uh, if you're a woman please uh, do the equivalency um, because it applies to women also. But what happens in as a part of the syzygy is that the anima for a man is the part of the man that projects or identifies a good mate and uh, the perfection of womanhood. So I think most of us have probably had an experience of falling in love at first sight. It's happened to me very often, as a matter of fact. And so my anima is very active. Um, and, um, uh, and so when you're looking for a mate, that's okay because uh, you see the perfect woman or if you're a woman and you're looking through the animus, you're meeting the perfect man or a reasonable facsimile thereof. It turns out that my anima really likes long brown hair. Uh, I'm, I'm not a big fan of uh, blonde hair. I'm a, I'm a long brown hair man, and that's mainly because that's the hair that my mother had when I was growing up. I'm sure that's the case. And so... Uh, my anima, when I see a woman with long brown hair, uh, my anima says, that's the one. And um, that's worked for me in finding two spouses, but it can also be troublesome because it sends me to, uh, to the possibility of having other problems because I see other women who also have long brown hair. Uh, but because I'm conscious of that, um, I am able to resist. And, um, and so this is one 
aspect of Jungian psychology that I do think we should be introducing to high school children uh, because uh, the problem is that um, once you get married, you um, have a spouse of the opposite sex there, presumably, or uh, of the opposite temperament, let's say, if, if there's a gay marriage. Uh, and um, that person doesn't turn out to be the perfect uh, person that your anima thought it was, uh, that person was. And then um, your anima is still operating archetypal, archetypally looking for the perfect mate. So you realize that this person you're lying next to isn't the perfect mate after all. And your anima is out there looking and trying to find the perfect mate again. And uh, that often leads to trouble. And that's why, in my opinion, or one of the main reasons why we have a society that has so many uh, divorces. And uh, I think that if we prepared children more for what can happen and how to have a mature attitude uh, toward marriage, uh, we'd be a lot better off. Um, and um, so anyway, Dr. Edinger talks about the two wives archetype. And what he means by this is that we should have one spouse that's external, that's our physical world spouse. And then we have our inner spouse, who, who is our anima. And uh, for men, it's the anima. And for women, it's the animus. And so as long as we keep our two wives uh, as one inner and one outer, um, things can go all right. But as soon as you have two physical world wives or two physical world husbands, obviously things get complicated. And I'll, I'll tell you an amusing little story. In Saudi Arabia, it's possible to have four wives, but there is a rule that you have to treat all your wives equally. And this is in Islam. And uh, I, I've only known one man that I knew of who had more than one wife. I do, um, I also knew a woman whose husband had more than one wife, but, um, but the man I knew that had more than one wife, um, one of them knew about the other one, but one of them didn't. And so he was a, a business colleague and uh, his his life was living hell because he was constantly on his cell phone uh, trying to juggle his wives and especially the wife who didn't know about the other one. And uh, so it was really kind of funny and embarrassing and sad all at the same time. Uh, in the other case, uh, the woman... Um, was quite happy with the arrangement because her husband, who was a professional man, I won't say more about him, um, but, uh, and I won't talk about the context of how I knew this woman, but um, she was quite happy with the situation because uh, she got three and a half days off a week <laughs> and then she didn't have to worry about her husband. And so, um, uh, you know, different strokes for different folks. But in terms of um, the United States and, and uh, our Western culture, um, I think it's probably best and advisable to keep uh, one wife inner and one wife outer. And uh, I think that we have a lot fewer troubles in our society. Um, now I'm going to uh, go back to uh, Dr. Edinger for a few minutes here and, um, and give you his um, comments about the syzygy. Um, and then I will come back to you 
and we can talk about this some more. Um, so here comes Dr. Edinger, and this um, this will be about uh, it's only two and a half minutes in this video, so. Now, turning to the animus and, and the anima, we're, we're reaching a deeper layer now. Uh, and here, the uh, social aspects uh, can, cannot be spelled out in such simple terms. They're, they're present but they're more complex and, and occult and a little harder to express. But certainly we can say that an individual who has even a rudimentary awareness of the reality of, of the anima or the animus uh, is going to have a more authentic, a, a more conscious, a more fruitful and realistic relation to the to the opposite sex. And after all, that relationship between the sexes is quite fundamental to this whole social process. The, the family is based on it and uh, the raising of children and uh, the, the welfare of uh, the uh, and psychological uh, early development of children that is very dependent on the level of conscious relationship that exists between between the parents and uh, that uh, uh, that type of understanding relationship that uh, can endure the inevitable conflict between the opposites of the sexes is uh, is very much promoted uh, and and helped by uh, an awareness of uh, the uh, animus and anima, because with that awareness, then one one avoids the crudest of uh, of projections, and can relate to the uh, to the partner in terms of their reality, rather than in terms of the illusory expectations one has when one has projected the anima or animus uh, onto the partner. Okay, uh, so that's Dr. Edinger on the syzygy, and um, I'll put my notes back up here. Um, okay, uh, so now I'm ready to go on to chapter four, which is the self, and this is the deepest archetype in the unconscious. Uh, it is called the God image sometimes, and uh, it's very important for us to understand this. The metaphysical God is not what we're talking about here. We're talking about an archetype like the mandala archetype or the mother archetype, but this is the, mo the strongest and most powerful archetype uh, in the psyche. And... Uh, while Dr. Edinger and Dr. Jung always are strong to differentiate between the God image in the psyche, which is an identifiable, exper experimentally uh, experienceable archetype, uh, they are not talking about the metaphysical God, which is the God that uh, the theologians speak of. Um, to me, as a lawyer, that's a bit of a distinction without a difference. I mean, Dr. Jung says uh, human beings can't tell the difference between the metaphysical God and the uh, God image. Um, and so to me, that's a bit of a distinction without a difference. Um, 
because if you can't tell the difference, then it's the same thing, basically. Um, but anyway, um, uh, that's what they say. And uh, they were, of course, in the late 20th century. The 20th century, Dr. Jung was trying to avoid a lot of criticism from theologians um, because he was trying to get his fledgling profession going, the profession of psychotherapy generally, and the pre profession of being a Jungian analyst specifically. And so he was trying to get that going. And uh, so he was trying to avoid confrontation with theologians. I think as we go forward, you will find that I am not trying to do that, uh, because I think that's a big thing that we have missed in our society and we need to change that so anyway the self the god image this is chapter four of ion the book and you can find my reading of these chapters and my reading of dr edinger's commentary on the chapters on the home page of the youtube channel so uh, this is the deepest archetype in the unconscious and it is often not constellated in early life. This is what you are dealing with in individuation. Young people are most often not experienced enough to face the dark side of the self, particularly until they have created a seaworthy ego by passing through the Job archetype numerous times. One needs to be able to make moral decisions in the ego, even when shadow material bubbles up, and that is often a problem. This is where people are in danger of going over to the dark side. And this is, uh, for example, in the Bible where Jesus was wrest wrestling with the devil. That was the power devil where the, the devil was offering him uh, worldly uh, kingships. And he said, my, uh, my kingdom is not of this world. Uh, but we all face this power devil at some point, And we need to be ready for it because uh, we all rise to our level of incompetence. That's the Peter principle. <laughs> Every, everybody keeps going up in organizations until they can't go any further. And usually when they Wherever they stop is where they're incompetent. But, <laughs> but anyway, if you go higher and higher in an organization, you tend to be offered more and more power. And so you need to keep your humility going. Um, so what can happen in the midlife crisis is that psychogenic experiences uh, can be evoked. For uh, This happened to me in 1993. I think most of you already know that fact. And uh, it happened to Dr. Jung during the Red Book period. And if you are ready for it, you are, you are better off. And it was in no way, I was no way in, prepared for it. Um, and uh, in Dr. Jung's case, he had the advantage of being a practicing psychiatrist with 13 years experience. And before these experiences commenced, and he was able to turn them into experiments on himself. Uh, when my experience occurred, it ended up being concretized in the form of a novel, but one I put in my drawer for 21 years because it was too much for me at the time, since some passages contained erotica, and I didn't know what to do with that. Uh, now I understand these were shadow contents, and I can talk about it with others as examples of personal experience of the shadow, but at least my ego was strong enough when it happened to know that I should put it in a drawer until I could understand it. And I spent a lot of time trying to figure this out. Um, now, one, one thing, this is a warning to everybody who studies Jungian psychology, uh, this experience was constellated by being exposed to archetypal material in the form of Women Who Run With the Wolves by Dr. Clarissa Pincola Estes. And at least I was consciously aware 
that I was using archetypal material because I was consciously using her book, but I was not prepared for the psychogenic experience of the constellation of my anima in the form of the heroine of my novel, Mako, who was a literal figure like Philemon and Salome for Dr. Jung. And she woke me up every day for eight months until her story was finished. And this is what archetypes do. They play through until they are finished and they are unstoppable. Caveat emptor. So if you kick off uh, the self in yourself, uh, you have to know that it's coming up in two streams. And one is the light side and one is the dark side. And so I do believe there are aspects of Dr. Jung's oeuvre that are appropriate for young people, but not necessarily individuation per se. Sometimes pe people who start the individuation process early, earlier, or people do start it earlier, but you must know that there are two very powerful streams from the deep unconscious self, one light and one dark. So when that happens, your ego must be strong enough to make moral decisions appropriate for the 21st century and your personal living conditions. The self is part of the two million year old man. In other words, part of your evolutionary being. And you got the model on the day you were born. It has not evolved any further since then. And so, uh, so the caveat is yourself doesn't have to live in the 21st century, but you do. And so you need a strong enough ego to make decisions about what should be happening and what should not be happening in your life. And you have to have the maturity to um, make those decisions properly. Um, and so let's see, I guess that's all I have of this. And I see we're running up against, we have about 12 minutes left uh, in this. I, I do want to play uh, the self part of Dr. Edinger's um, video uh, into this. And so what I'm going to do is play that. Um, and um, let's see. Where's... Trying to figure out how to get rid of my Okay, get rid of that. And then, okay, so I will come back to you. We only have about 12 minutes left, 11 minutes left. And this part of this video is about six minutes long. And so anything we can't finish tonight, uh, I'll be happy to take up next week. Now, coming finally to the uh, question of the self the awareness of, of the self. The self is the center and totality of the psyche. One of its synonyms is the, is the inner God image. It's the transpersonal authority of the psyche uh, the ego is the smaller authority, and the, and the self is the larger authority. Uh, when one has made a contact with the self, uh, the ego then becomes relativized and recognizes that its life must be uh, uh, governed by an authority uh, higher than itself. Now, what, what does such a recognition have to do with society? A great deal indeed. In a certain sense, we can say that society is the exteriorized mirror 
of the psyche. Uh, every society has uh, a, a leader of, of some sort. Uh, at one stage, it was the, it was the king or the, or the, or the president. Uh, occasionally, it's, uh, it's an oligarchy of, uh, of aristocrats. But uh, always, in order for a, a society to, to be cohesive and, and exist organically, it has to have a central authority. And that central external social authority is a mirror of the inner authority of the self. That's why when one has dreams of a, of a king or of a president or of Washington, D.C., uh, in most cases, those dreams refer to the self. So what's at issue here is the individual's uh, relation to authority. Uh, if one has no uh, connection to the, uh, to the self, and particularly when the, when the ego is weak, when there's low, low level of uh, psychological differentiation, uh, especially in times of uh, turmoil, social turmoil and, uh, and distress, there is a strong tendency for the self, the center, central organizing authority, principle of the psyche, to be projected. Uh, because in times of turmoil, the, uh, the compensatory sec uh, aspect of the psyche activates and turmoil uh, uh, then tends to constellate uh, order. Disorder constellates order, and uh, uh, order in such circumstances often has to be imposed uh, with some level of uh, discipline and authoritarianism. Uh, and so what can happen in such cases then is that one gets uh, massive collective projections of the self uh, in, onto the, uh, the, uh, the leader, the Fuhrer, for instance. That's what happened in Nazi Germany. It's a, uh, it's a, uh, I'm looking for an adequate word to, to describe uh, it, it. It's an, it's an, a lesson of instruction of a magnitude that could hardly be uh, exaggerated as to the dangers of the projection, the collective projection of the self. That's what happened in Nazi Germany. Uh, we see it happening in all sorts of uh, uh, charismatic uh, religious cults. Uh, it, it's happening in small scale all over, scattered uh, all around. And as we lose our containment in, in, our, uh, uh, in our conventional religious myth, this danger is going to become more and more uh, operative. Uh, and it's probably the, uh, the greatest threat to humanity, uh, much greater than the uh, uh, nuclear bomb. Okay, uh, so I've actually already uh, shown the latter part of this uh, video with uh, my... Um, Q&A last week on the answer to Job section, uh, so I won't go on with it, but uh, you have the name of it, it's, um, you have the name of the video, so you can watch the whole thing if you want to, it's Edward F. 
Edinger Social Implications, 19, 1997. So um, I think that YouTube starts to push me off, or actually what they do is erase the beginning and, and have a moving cursor. So after uh, four more minutes, I'm going to start losing the beginning of my um, stream for the for the replay uh, so I am available um, you can contact me at skip.com over gmail.com for private uh, conversations uh, I am not a mental health professional and I will not be giving doing dream analysis but I'm happy to communicate with you and to tell you what I can about Dr. Young's work. Uh, if, if there's any other comments that anybody has or any other questions that I can fill in quickly in the next two, three minutes, I'd be happy to do that. Otherwise, uh, our next opportunity, um, our next official opportunity will be uh, Thursday at 1.30 p.m. when we will continue on with Answer to Job and we will be discussing paragraphs 625 to 648. Um, and I've already done a combination video with those paragraphs involved. And so um, uh, you can find that on the YouTube channel pretty readily, I think. And it's also in the Answer to Job playlist and so it's a it's an it's my reading of those paragraphs which is about 40 minutes long uh, if you want to read them in advance of the session on Thursday so it's uh, Thursday at 1 30 p.m. Eastern U.S. time uh, I'm looking over here because I also turned on Periscope and I've been having uh, Periscope viewers right along and it appears that several of them are Arabic so they are uh, writing to me in Arabic I'll have to have my Arabic friend uh, uh, translate some of those because I, I can't read Arabic right off the top um, but anyway um, so anyway not uh, seeing any further comment from you uh, I guess I'll call this meeting to a close. I'm sorry this ended up being much more of a lecture than a meeting. Um, I hope next week to have further discussion among the group. And so do please come with your intention to ask questions or to needle me further. Freaky Brother says, thanks a lot for your time. This has been very helpful clarifying Jungian perspectives for me. I hope so. Uh, and I'm certainly happy to uh, discuss more. Um, in, when we were having our face-to-face -face meetings here in Annapolis, uh, I had agreed uh, not to discuss political issues or religious issues in the group. Uh, I make no such promise uh, now that uh, we've moved entirely online. So I am prepared to discuss political issues in a generic sense and hopefully in a Jungian sense. In other words, I will try to talk about uh, our, red our red state, blue state neurosis in as even-handed a manner as I can, uh, recognizing that um, the people I don't agree with on the political front uh, represent my shadow and um, and so they're part of me and I will uh, therefore not be trying to take them apart from a political uh, perspective at least not uh, on the YouTube or on this particular YouTube channel um, I do have a couple of other YouTube channels, which I may uh, gin up over the next few weeks. We'll see. Um, and those will be much more political. But uh, 
And as you probably know, I wrote a book called uh, Political Psychology, New Ideas for Activists in 2014. If you are a member of our Dropbox, you can find it for free in electronic form uh, in the Dropbox. If not, please, uh, you can become a member of the Dropbox simply by sending me an email to skip.conover at gmail.com and I will be happy to include you. But I am now two hours into this program, so I'm going to discontinue uh, the stream now uh, so I don't lose the beginning for the replay. I'll see you all soon. Bye.